Over at National Review Online, Andrew Stiles, this kid's doing a hell of a job over there. He writes, a majority of Hispanic voters think legal status to illegal immigrants should be granted only after a goal of stopping 90% of future illegal immigration has been achieved, according to a new survey by Republican pollster John McLaughlin. Now, let me also suggest something while I'm going through this. You bloggers out there, you folks who contribute to various websites with your own writings, your own thinking, and so forth, and when you're ripped off by talk show hosts that don't give you credit, you really ought to call them out. Help me clean up this business. You really should call them out. And not only that, folks, when I do something like this and use a direct source, we link to this source after the program, and so you can access it yourself directly. By a margin of 60% to 34%, registered Hispanic voters said they supported granting legal status to illegal immigrants, quote, only when the 90% goal is reached. That is 90% apprehension. Hispanic adults backed the proposal by a nearly identical margin, 60% to 32%. The proposal offered in the poll is even more hawkish than the one put forward by Senator John Cornyn of Texas, who offered an amendment to the Gang of Aid immigration bill that would have required a 90% border apprehension rate before illegal immigrants have already been granted legal status under the legislation could apply for citizenship. But Cornyn's amendment was rejected by the Gang of Eight, and uh, instead they pushed for this border surge amendment, so-called, pushed by Senator Bob Corker and Senator John Hoven, which establishes a 90% apprehension rate as a guideline that has no bearing on the granting of legal status or citizenship. And the Congressional Budget Office estimated that even the Corker-Hoven amendment, if it were fully implemented, which of course Obama won't do, would only reduce illegal immigration by a third to a half. So all of the, it's like Obamacare, going through all of this, enormous expense, societal dislocation, turning the Constitution on its head, and the problem doesn't go away. It gets worse from a financial point of view, an immigration point of view, a cultural point, all of it. Now they found out some other very interesting things in this poll. By a margin of 56 to 40 percent, Hispanic voters oppose allowing illegal immigrants to obtain federal funds, excuse me, federal benefits, including Obamacare, while they're going through the legalization process and before the 90 percent goal is reached. I told you, what, what you're being fed is propaganda, day in and day out. When asked to choose which of the four issues, the economy, immigration reform, education, or health care is most important to them, Registered Hispanic voters said immigration reform was their lowest priority, just like every other American. Just 31% ranked the issue first or second, compared with 62% of the economy, 57% health care, 45% education. Non-registered voters, on the other hand, ranked immigration reform as their highest priority. Non-registered voters, probably illegal immigrants. Generally speaking, registered Hispanic voters were far more likely to support tougher security and enforcement measures than non-registered voters. For example, 64% of registered voters said they supported employment verification to determine if job applicants are lawful residents, compared with just 46% of non-registered voters. And I could go on and on, and we will link to this story at National Review Online by Andrew Stiles. And if you're interested, you ought to take a look at it. But here's the question. When you have a lawless president, why does any of this matter? Triggers, you hear these, oh, we have triggers. Not on guns, that would be bad. No, triggers in our legislation. All kinds of triggers. We're going to create the Berlin Wall all right on our southern border. You notice when I started attacking that idiocy, they don't say that anymore. But we have talked at length. When you have a lawless president who refuses to enforce so many laws or aspects of laws he doesn't agree with, what do you think this president will do with this law? Should it pass? Mr. Stiles wrote about it yesterday. I've been talking about it for a long time. Not one of the preeminent former jurists and legal minds in the country today, a fellow by the name of Michael McConnell, former judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, professor of law, director of Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School, senior fellow at the Hoover Institute, he says the same thing. And of all places, the Wall Street Journal, the Open Borders editorial page. 
and he points out that Obama's decision last week to suspend the employer mandate of the Obamacare law may be welcome relief to businesses affected by this provision, but it raises grave concerns about his understanding of the role of the executive in our system of government. Let me just politely correct that. He understands what the role of the executive is supposed to be in our system of government. He chooses not to comply with it. Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution states that the President, quote, shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed, unquote. This is a duty, not a discretionary power. And while the President does have substantial discretion about how to enforce a law, he has no discretion about whether to enforce a law. This matters, the limits of executive power, because it has deep historical roots. During the period of royal absolutism, English monarchs asserted a right to dispense with parliamentary statutes they disliked. King James II's use of the prerogative was a key grievance that led to the glorious revolution of 1688. The very first provision of the English Bill of Rights of 1689, the most important precursor to the U.S. Constitution, declared that, quote, the pretended power of suspending the laws or the execution of laws by regal authority without consent of Parliament is illegal, unquote. This, ladies and gentlemen, is precisely why I've been calling this president the imperial president, because that's exactly what he is. And you hear butkus from the media. Nothing. To make sure that American presidents could not resurrect a similar prerogative, the framers of the Constitution made the faithful enforcement of the law a constitutional duty, an imperative, and every Justice Department in recent times, in modern times, has noted this. A president cannot refuse to enforce a statute he opposes for policy reasons. He can refuse to enforce it if he believes it's unconstitutional, but not for policy reasons. Attorneys General under Carter, Reagan, both Bushes and Clinton all agreed on this point. This is not the first time with Obamacare, where Obama suspended the employer mandate. Not the first time Obama has suspended the operation of statutes by executive degree. But it's the most barefaced. In June of last year, the administration stopped initiating deportation proceedings against some 800,000 illegal aliens who came to the U.S. before age 16, lived here for at least five years, and met a variety of other criteria. This was after Congress refused to enact the DREAM Act, which would have allowed these individuals to stay in accordance with these same conditions. So Obama just bypassed Congress. Earlier in 2012, Obama effectively replaced congressional requirements governing state compliance under the No Child Left Behind Act with new ones that he crafted. He rewrote the statute. This used to be an impeachable offense. Don't mention it. Uh, uh, don't say it. Obama defended his suspension of the immigration laws and as an exercise of, quote, prosecutorial discretion, unquote. He defended his amending of the No Child Left Behind Act as an exercise of authority in the statute, to waive certain requirements. The administration has yet to offer a legal justification for last week's suspension of the employer mandate under Obamacare. And what of immigration reform? Why bother debating the details of a compromise if future presidents will feel free to disregard those parts of the statute that they don't like? I've told this to Paul Ryan. I've told it to Marco Rubio. I've said it over these airwaves month after month, time and time again. Obama will pick and choose what he wants to enforce under the best law. He's the one that won't enforce existing law. There was nothing wrong with the 1986 enforcement provisions, ladies and gentlemen. We can argue the amnesty, of course. But the enforcement provisions, the securing the border, the E-Verify, that individuals would have to learn English proficiently, that they would have to pay a fine, do all these things you hear today. But they don't have to because it's not enforced. They don't enforce the border. They won't build the border fence. 2006, they specifically passed a law to do exactly that. 700 miles, they built 36. And the Republicans participated in this sham. Mr. Boehner, you're making a lot of conflicting statements, sir. Not unusual for you. A lot of conflicting statements. Border security first. Out of one side of your mouth, out of the other side of your mouth, you've convinced Mr. Gutierrez, the radical from Chicago, that you're on his side. Well, which is it, Mr. Boehner? You've got a wet finger in the air? You're trying to check things out, see how it goes? I think so. I think so. Don't pass anything. Or if you pass anything, border security only, 
No more, no less. Then we'll deal with the rest. 